story I'm about to share with you takes place in Oklahoma in the late 1800s. In the old days, there was plenty of game out on the prairie, but nevertheless, back in the winter of 1895, our family suffered a food shortage. The harvest had been bad, and we were hard up for ammunition too. Thanksgiving Day was drawing close, and we were down to one bullet when Mama sent me out to bring home something, anything, for dinner. I buttoned my overalls, pulled on my jacket and cap, and trudged out the door of our dugout, hoping maybe I could bag a squirrel, they weren't in the church, or a sage hen to go with the potatoes and cabbage that Mama had saved back for our feast. Not much to feed 11 of us, plus the family and friends who always drop by on holidays, but at least our table might have some meat for a change. I hadn't gone far when I saw a scrawny little rabbit crouched in a plum thicket. I crept up on it, and I was about to take aim when I heard the call of a wild turkey. I looked away from the rabbit and up to the branch of a nearby cottonwood tree. And there on a narrow limb sat 12 of the fattest turkeys that I had ever seen. 12 turkeys. There was no way I could miss hitting at least one of them. So I sighted my rifle directly on the plumpest bird, took a deep breath, and gently squeezed the trigger. The gun recoiled and sent me spinning backwards. I landed in a covey of quail and killed six of them with my fall. <laughs> Hooray, I shouted, meat on the table for Thanksgiving. Then I remembered the turkeys. I looked up in the cottonwood tree and gasped. Somehow, my shot had split the branch, and those turkeys, startled by the blast, must have fluttered up a bit. Just as the big 12 big birds began to settle back down on the limb, the two pieces of the limb snapped back together and caught the middle toe of each of those turkeys, trapping them there. I tied the quail together, and I was preparing to climb up and retrieve my turkeys when the tree gave a shudder and fell over. I guess all that flapping and fussing of those big birds just shook that old tree right out of the ground and roots and all. When the cottonwood fell over, it squashed the coon and possum that were living inside of it. I tied those to the string along with the quail and was about to heft the branch of squawking turkeys to my shoulder when I noticed something oozing out of the side of the tree. I knelt down and sure enough, there were some of the purest, sweetest honey you ever saw tucked inside a hollow branch. So I slipped the honeycomb into my jacket pocket and commenced to walking home with my bounty. Hadn't gone far when I heard the tall grass beside me rustle, skittering around, crippled but not yet killed by my fall onto them, were two more quail. Once again, frightened by me, they were making a run for the creek. So I threw down the turkeys, the coon, the possum, the honeycomb, and the other quail and began to chase those two wounded birds. But just as we reached the edge of the water, those critters surprised me and darted away in the opposite direction. I was going too fast by then to stop, and so I tumbled head first into the creek. I swallowed a lot of water and came up spitting, just regretting my own greed. Slowly, I swam to shore and hauled myself out of the creek. It was hard to crawl up over the bank and up the side harder than it had ever been before. As I stepped out onto dry land, I squashed a big toad frog and, frog and killed that too. I reached into the front pocket of my overalls for another piece of twine to tie that toad frog to my string of birds and possum, but instead I pulled out a 17-pound catfish. I reached into my other pockets, and sure enough, there were fish in them too. Sunfish, perch, bass, even a Rocky Mountain trout, although how it got to Oklahoma, I never could figure out. Plus, the little rolled-up cuffs of my overalls were filled with crawdads, dozens of them. 
By now I was so weighed down by my hunting and fishing fortunes that I could hardly walk. Yet somehow I managed to haul a covey of quail, a squished possum, coon, and toad frog, a 17-pound catfish, along with some sunfish, perch, bass, and trout, three or four dozen crawdads, one gleaming honeycomb, and 12 gobbling turkeys back to our dugout. Mama, mama, come quick, I shouted when I was just a few yards from the door. Look what I've got. I was so pleased that my chest swelled with pride, and I popped a button right off the front of my overalls. That button flew into a plum thicket and knocked a rabbit clean out of this life and into the next. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that year our family sat down to a marvelous Thanksgiving dinner, a feast accomplished with just one single bullet. What a blessing that would have been. Don't know if you've ever had a feast like that uh, or such an, a bounty to come from one single bullet. But with that in mind, I'd like you to turn to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, because this certainly sounds like a bit like the story I just shared with you. And notice the statement here in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, where Malachi wrote, bring all the tithes into my storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now, put me to the test in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Not room enough to receive it. Do you feel as though this describes you, your situation? Or do you feel as though you still have some room and could fit in a few more blessings if they came your way, or that the windows of heaven haven't been opened to you? How does this strike you as far as your life? Notice also Job chapter 36. Job 36, and Job reflected on this when he wrote. Job 36, first of all, verse five where he reminds us, behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in strength of understanding. Then notice verse 11. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Job talked about certain prosperity for obedience to God, for serving God. Or Psalm 1 song that we sing fairly often, probably know the, most of the words by heart to this psalm. Psalm 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, where we read, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Do these verses describe your life? When you think about and examine your life, examine yourself, how do you feel about your life and the promises God makes about life, about prosperity, about blessings? Some have looked at these promises and others and have come to the conclusion that they have nothing to do with this physical life but have only to do with the spiritual promises of eternal life, the kingdom of God, and have nothing to do with this physical life. Is that the case? And for some people, verses like these can be discouraging when or if we look around and often have on our minds the question, why isn't God blessing me? I don't know if that question has ever come to your mind, but we may have asked, why isn't God blessing me or why hasn't God blessed me? In Psalm 73, David had that thought. Psalm 73, notice verses 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 73, verse 1. 
David wrote, truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He became envious, he says, discouraged perhaps even at the prosperity of the wicked. Has that ever happened to you or to any of us? That we became a bit discouraged at the prosperity of the wicked. Or maybe even at the prosperity of a friend. And that discouraged us because we weren't experiencing the same blessings. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why are they being blessed more than I am? And maybe sometimes our teens or our children wonder, they see others they know and they see blessings that that family seems to have or things they have that we don't have and wonder, why aren't we blessed that way? We know we shouldn't compare, but we're human. And sometimes it's hard not to, especially when we face unexpected bills, unexpected illnesses, setbacks, we can begin to compare and wonder, what's happening in my life? Suppose you really aren't being blessed. That happens sometimes too. We go through some really difficult challenges and it feels like, why is this going on so long and I'm really not being blessed? It can happen. What do the scriptures say about that? Uh, there are some good questions I think we probably all have asked ourselves during those times. I've listed a few. I think the place we all wonder is, am I habitually disobeying God in something? Because that can bring certain trials or, in a sense, curses on us. Or are we faithfully following the financial laws in the Bible? Those can bring blessings, or as we read in Malachi, curses as well, if we're not. Or do we apply the laws of success that we know are in the Bible and put those into practice in our life? Uh, how about just being aware of the needs of others, especially the poor? You know, when you read in Proverbs chapter 19, Proverbs 19, there's a principle that is an important principle as it applies to God's blessings. I'll tell you a story about related to that in a little bit, but Proverbs 19, verse 17, there is this statement. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he, God, will pay back what he has given. Or Proverbs 28 and verse 27. Proverbs 28 and verse 27. He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. In other words, there's a principle the Bible teaches, generosity being a generous person. And that's an important question sometimes to ask ourselves. Have I learned to be a generous person? Or have I asked God to bless me? No, that's not wrong to ask God to bless us as we go through life. In Philippians 4 and verse 6, that's well, what Paul wrote about that. Philippians 4 and verse 6. And why should we do that? Philippians 4 verse 6, Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We're reminded to ask God. With thanksgiving, we ask to show God that we understand that all of our blessings come from him. One of the primary reasons we would ask God to bless us, that we recognize that those things come from God and that God is the source of all blessings and all the good things of life. So these are questions we would ask ourselves or could ask ourselves if we look at our life and say, why am I not being blessed? But what if we are doing those things? Not perfect, because none of us are, but we're striving with God's help to grow. We do keep these principles in mind, and yet we still feel unblessed. Then it's important to ask one more question and other questions. Another question, that is, how am I measuring blessings? How do I count my blessings? How do I measure them? What gauge do we use to measure our blessings? What is the main measure of how much a Christian is blessed? What is the primary measure of that? I thought as we, at this time of the year, as we prepare to celebrate a day of Thanksgiving, we recount our blessings, maybe we even have our children at the Thanksgiving table 
or grandchildren talk about blessings of the past year or the way that God has looked after us. I thought it would be good to consider that question about God's blessings in our life. How am I measuring blessings? How should I measure God's blessings? Let's put some things in perspective and go back a ways. Let's go back in time for a moment to the day you were born. Do you remember? What do you remember about that day? Probably nothing. I don't think any of us remember anything about the day we were born, but how much of a say did you have in what happened that day? Do you get to choose whether you were born at home or born in a hospital? Of course not. We didn't have any say in that. Did you get to choose who would be there? Of course not. We had no say in the matter. Suddenly you were just there. You had been given this wonderful gift of life. And none of us had done anything to earn that. But as time went on, did you earn childhood by being a fantastic baby? In other words, did your mother and father have a discussion about keeping you or not keeping you depending on what kind of a baby you were going to be? Many of us might not have made it <laughs> beyond the baby stage. Or did you earn adolescence by being a fantastic child? Great child, I think we'll keep him now and into adolescence. And then you ruined it all as a teenager. No, that, hopefully not. But the gift of life was given to us. And what an enormous blessing that really is. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 8, back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and here in verse 18, Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, something God wants us to remember, to reflect on, to be thankful about. He said to Israel, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. In other words, with the gift of life, came the blessings of all the talents, the skills, the aptitudes, the, the abilities that we have that enable us to learn, to work, to play an instrument, to be able to sing, maybe to be good at sports, to accumulate wealth as we go through life by making good decisions, to be good at art, whatever we have as strengths, we certainly have our weaknesses, but all those things come from God. Even our appearance comes from God. And we look in the mirror and maybe, you know, especially during those teen years, we wish we had, you know, a smaller nose or smaller ears or more hair or this color hair or curly hair if it's straight or straight hair if it's curly. Whatever we don't have, we often want in our physical appearance. But... All those factors came from God. We inherited through the genetic laws that God put in place. We inherited those things. We can modify them to, to some degree, but basically who we are and the skills we have, the aptitudes, the personality, to a large degree, were gifts from God. So what is it that makes us feel like we may not be blessed when we feel that way? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, usually it's the result of something that Paul addressed here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Now it's in a little different context, but the principle is here. When Paul said, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. In other words, there's an important principle here about comparing ourselves with others in an unwise way. And we've probably all done that at different times. Let me give you an example, hypothetical example. I don't have anybody in particular in mind, just totally hypothet hypothetical example. You have an old car. Your friend has a similar old car. And you've both been happy with it. 
you're happy with your car. It was a blessing when you got it. You've had it a long time. It solved a problem that you had at the time. And it still runs good. It has a few rough spots on it. But it still is very serviceable. You take care of it and you're happy with it. And you drive to church one Sabbath and your friend has a new car. He no longer has that same old car that he had. Maybe a thought goes through your mind. I wonder how he's paying for this. Of course, we're human, so we think those things. You know, he makes about the same money as I do, and how come he has that and I've got this? Suddenly, the car you were thankful for and appreciated as a blessing that was a blessing now begins to look a little more worn out, a little older, and maybe you're disappointed with it. Why? What happened? Nothing has changed except that your friend now has a new car, a different car. And now maybe we feel unblessed. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. It may not be with a car. It may be with something else, a home or a job or an opportunity. It could be with anything. And those kinds of thoughts can, can go through our mind. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 20 and see the example that Christ gave about this kind of thing. Matthew chapter 20, as it pertains to blessings and counting our blessings. Matthew 20, beginning in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven, Christ said, is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. You recall the story, but it's interesting that Jesus Christ puts it in the context of this is what the kingdom of God is like. The, the thinking here and the attitudes and what happens, this relates to being in God's kingdom and on the path to God's kingdom. So a land landowner went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, a fair wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So here he hired some, and for them it was a blessing. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for blessing comes from the, the word barak, which means prosperity or liberality. The Greek word eulogia, a matter of bounty or a benefit. These men didn't have a job. They needed a job. And something they were wishing for, hoping for, had prepared for, happened. They were hired for a fair wage. They would have the blessing of a good day's pay. So he went out, verse 3, to hire others, saw others standing idle, and said to them, Verse 4, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. Also, blessings there. These men were, they were all happy. They were all looking forward to being paid. They would be able to use the money for things they needed. It was a, a blessing that had occurred to all of them. Verse 8. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. When those, who came, those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. Now, up to that point, up to the words in verse 10, a denarius. Up to those words, everyone was still happy. They were all thankful for their blessing. But then their attitude changed, those who were hired first, verse 11. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. What they had considered a wonderful blessing just earlier that day, now they weren't satisfied. They were upset with the very same thing. Verse 12, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and heat of the day. And now they consider the landowner unfair. Verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? 
Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? In other words, he asked him, are you in a, a bad mood? Are you in a wrong attitude because I'm being generous? Is that why you're in a bad attitude? And they considered him unfair. Sometimes we may fall into the same kind of thinking with God. God is being unfair with us, and maybe we've had those thoughts at times as well. But this happened as they compared themselves among themselves here in an unwise way. And so they felt treated unfairly. What are your circumstances in life? Think about your life. I've thought about my life up to this point. And what was your background like? Solid, happy, united family, all together, or a broken home? How about education? Did you have a good formal education or maybe real positive vocational training that prepared you well for life or little preparation at all and kind of fumbled your way for a while until you kind of made your way? What was your education like? How about physical attributes? Have you inherited good health, strong constitution because you know that your parents were that way and grandparents and so you've always been healthy your whole life and or problems with physical disabilities and illnesses that come far too frequently. Finances, where you taught and learned early in life how to earn, how to save, how to manage your finances, or didn't have a clue as you got into adulthood. What was your background? What were those things that happened that were strengths to you? Or maybe those things that were not strengths that you had to, for some people our background is a strength, for, some, for others, our background may be something to overcome. And we've had to learn how to do those things. And there are many more examples we could go on with, but all of those that I just mentioned are probably mentioned, uh, represented here in some way. When we compare ourselves to others, especially in the area of physical possessions, and assume we aren't blessed, it's easy to kind of lose sight of what the real blessings are. Let's go back to James chapter 1. In verse 16, James 1, talking about how we count our blessings and how sometimes we compare unwisely and lose sight of those blessings. James 1, verse 16 through 18. That's what James wrote. He said, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, from God, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And we know God is totally fair all the time. God knows best how to distribute gifts, talents, Spiritual gifts, physical gifts, God knows how to distribute those things. Um, he knows what's good for us and when at the right time. God is well aware of all of those things. As parents, I think we've all asked questions at time about, well, should I give this to my children or to my son or to my daughter, or should I make them work for it? Should I... You know, is this going to be a blessing to them if I just give them this, or should I hold off and wait? Or am I holding back something that really would be good? We wonder, when is the right time to give this or to provide that, this blessing or that blessing? And we're not always sure. We do the best we can. We wish we had perfect judgment and that we always did it right, but God does. God has that. God knows exactly when it's best to give or hold a thing back from us. We're all in God's hands, and he is a perfect father, a perfect loving God. How do we feel when our children, because we've had this experience, maybe you have as well. Here we have children that we love dearly. We've given them of our time of you know, physical possessions, gifts, we, we love them dearly, and they become discouraged because of something they don't have. 
they have a friend and this friend has this or that and or they have this ability but not that ability they wish they had this talent they wish they had that talent or that gift and and they get very discouraged about that and wonder why don't i have i wish i could be more like wish i could have more of this or more of that and they kind of pout about it and they get discouraged about it we've probably all seen that happen with our children when we were children we probably all did that but how do we as parents feel you know when that happens of course we want to encourage our children we, we try to lift them up and lift their spirits and point out other things they do have and other blessings they do have and among those blessings do we point out to them and teach them constantly the most important one and we'll talk about that shortly here how does God feel when one of his begotten children whom he has called open their mind to the truth given his spirit given various spiritual gifts, how does God feel as a loving father and one of those children have gotten into a, a negative frame of mind or a negative spirit because of lack of some whatever, name it, material possession, position, opportunity, and they get very discouraged over that. How does God feel if they were to dwell on that? And of course, we've probably experienced some of those things. So what are a Christian's greatest blessings? Or what is, what would you list as number one? What is a Christian's greatest blessing? One that is so important to teach our children that they have this perspective. We find it back in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. It gives us really the, the big picture of the greatest blessing of all. Luke chapter 12 we begin reading here in verse 15. And again, a story you're familiar with. Christ told them another parable. And he said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Those things are fine. It's wonderful to have material blessings and things that we can enjoy. Those things are fine if our attitude is right. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, bigger. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Remember, it was a lesson about covetousness. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Being rich toward God, our greatest blessing. I think it's so important that we remember that. Are we rich toward God? What does that mean? How do we... How are we? How do we become rich toward God? How do we teach our children that in all of this materialistic age in which we live, with social media where people can instantly see, well, guess where we've been and guess what I have and guess what we've done and, and all of the information just floods people you know, showing and sharing what they have and what they've done and Others can look at and say, wow, boy, they must be having a great life in here. What am I doing? You know, and make us wonder and feel jealous that we didn't have what they had. It's the age in which we live. And our children can be very susceptible towards that as well. It's important that we teach our children that the greatest blessing of all is to be rich toward God and what that means. To keep that in perspective and to add that to our thinking always that here our family has learned how to be rich toward God. And our children understand what that means. And we teach them that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Here is a way to be rich toward God that Paul described in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. One way, Paul said, if you then were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, 
not on things on the earth. Nothing wrong with things that are on the earth, nothing wrong with having physical things, but where is our mind and heart most set on? Paul said the blessings that are a Christian's greatest blessings are not readily visible. It's not something we can quickly just see. They're not visible. They're perceived by faith. They're things that can't be touched or taken home and displayed or put up on Facebook or on other social media venues. They're not, those are not the greatest blessings. But being rich towards God includes or means having our minds set on things of God, set on things above. Another way is found in 1 Timothy 6. Paul wrote this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. Another way to be rich toward God, we find here. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 1 and 2. First he says, Let as many bondservants, slaves, as are under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. In other words, here some were being called into God's truth, into the church, in a condition in which they were slaves. And God, Paul said, honor God, serve them, um, learn to be content in that state. And then he says, verse 2, and those who have believing masters. Here's one who he's called into the church. His master is now a slave, or is a slave owner. And they're both in the church. Well, God instructed, or Paul instructed masters as well. But here, those who were slaves, he said, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. That would be hard to do, to be in that kind of situation. But Paul gave instructions about that. But then he continues in verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment. So learning how to be content is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with ease, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, that is, have a covetousness about it. It's an overwhelming desire, and this is what drives them. Fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Verse 11 and 12 is a good outline of what it means to be rich towards God. And how? to be rich toward God. So Paul here speaks about the real blessings of, uh, of life for a, a true Christian and shows that God's ways, when we live God's ways, are never a burden to us. We never ought to consider them a burden. They really aren't a burden. What makes an object or an experience a blessing? Have you thought about that? What is it that when we say, you know, I really had this blessing, what makes an object or a, an experience a blessing. If our greatest blessings are spiritual, but yet we know that God does, at times, does bless with physical things, what, what really makes it a blessing? I'll give you a couple of examples. I knew a gentleman many years ago in another congregation I passed. I may have told you the story in another setting, another sermon, but this was a gentleman that was quite wealthy. He was a church member. He was... A very generous man, not just to members of the church, but to members of the community. He had a reputation for being a generous man. He owned a sawmill and bought and sold timber. And he called me one Sunday morning about, oh, just before 7 o'clock in the morning, surprised me, and he said, Mr. Nesco, you've got to come up right now. He lived about 25 miles north of me. He said, you've got to come here right away. And I said, well, what's going on, Martin? He said, well, I, I can't tell you. Just come. I've got to show you. So I got dressed, jumped in the car, and drove 25 miles up to his place and got there. And I said, what, what's happening or what's wrong? And he said, get in my truck. He still didn't tell me what was going on. 
So let's get my truck. So he hopped in his pickup truck. And we're driving down the county highway. And the night before, there had been a, an ice storm. Roads were clear by this time, but there had been an ice storm. As we drove along this county highway, there were trees that had just been branches broken, trees fallen over, collapsed wires, all kinds of damage to all kinds of timber. And he said, now, up ahead, just about there, and he pointed just a little ways ahead, he said, property that I own begins. And when we crossed that line, there was not a broken branch, not a broken tree, not a broken piece of lumber anywhere in that property. We drove a little ways, and he said, now, right there, my property ends. And when we crossed that line, it went back to broken trees, broken branches, and you know, all kinds of damage. But in his acres of timber that he had purchased and you know, was up for sale, there was not a broken limb, not a broken tree, not a broken branch, but on both sides, there was. And I was glad he called me that morning <laughs> and that uh, he wanted to show me this because clearly God had blessed him and had just protected him. Another situation, a young couple had moved into a home that they had bought, kind of scraped together what they could to afford the down payment, moved into an older home. And it was back in the 70s, and it had this shag carpeting used to be really popular. And the ugliest gold color of shag carpeting that you can imagine was in that home. And it was worn, and this couple couldn't really afford to put new carpeting, so they, they uh, went for a while with that shag carpeting. One day, a member of that congregation who uh, was known just for helping people, he just, you know, he was an older gentleman, and he just helped people. That was his gift. He was a helper. And he called the, this couple and he said, there's a man I know who's going out of the carpet business. He's moving to Florida. He's retiring. All his carpeting in his warehouse is for sale. Good prices. And so he had invited this couple to come over and take a look. And they looked and looked and looked and uh, unrolled some carpeting. And there was this beautiful neutral tone carpeting. They said it was 44 yards of carpeting. And the owner of the business has said, anything you find you can have for a dollar a yard. That carpeting had sold originally for almost $30 a yard, had been returned by the people who had bought it because... There was a, it looked like a piece of white yarn, maybe eight inches long, where dye had not taken on that little strip. And so 44 yards of carpeting returned because it wasn't perfect. There was a white streak, about eight inches to a foot long. And so uh, this gentleman said to the owner, he said, you mean they can have this for a dollar a yard? He kind of gulped and said, well, that's what I said. So they bought 44 yards of carpeting for a dollar a yard, $44. They hired somebody and paid him 100 bucks to install it. And when he installed it, it carpeted their entire living room, their dining room, and their hallway. And where that white strip of undyed carpet was had to be cut out anyway because it was in a corner and it ran up the side of the corner and it had to be cut out. So it turned out to be perfect carpeting for their home. And, of course, it was a blessing. I may have told you a story also about a young man that I knew in Alabama that came to church one Sabbath with his wrist in a cast. And he had fallen the day before, tripped on some hurdles. He was a track and field runner. And he had fallen and tripped on hurdles and broke his wrist. Knew it was broken. They went to the family doctor who did x-rays. And the wrist was fractured in many places. And so the doctor said he couldn't deal with that. He put it in a cast, but he made an appointment for them to see a specialist the next week gave them the x-rays, and then they came to services the next day, and he asked to be anointed, so I anointed him. They went to the specials the following week, and the next Sabbath, Mark came back and came up to me first thing, and he said, look, and he just kind of waved his wrist, and I said, what happened? He said, well, we went to the specialist, and he took some x-rays, and then he took another batch of x-rays, and then he said, I don't know what's going on, but you don't have a broken bone in your wrist. And God clearly had healed this young man. Of course, that was a blessing. All of these were certainly blessings. A, a, a true blessing promotes well-being and happiness in our relationship with God, first and foremost, but also in our relationships with others and a certain peace of mind within ourselves 
A true blessing promotes all of that, peace, and peace of mind in our relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves. And the more situations in life that a person can be happy in, the greater, the more he is blessed. From what I see in the scriptures, we all know examples of people who live in very difficult situations, yet seem to be some of the happiest people we know. The Ali sisters we met in India, you know, very difficult situation. Uh, neither of them are in good health, and yet they're very cheery, very positive. And we had a lady in, in Georgia that had very little as far as her physical possessions, but she came to church always with a big smile on her face, and everybody just loved her. She was one of the happiest people we had ever known. Yet she lived in some very difficult circumstances in rural Georgia. Physical circumstances are not the most important thing. Uh, you know, they're all, they are important to all of us, but not the most important thing. The more situations we can be happy in, the more we seem to be blessed. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul said this in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1. Being blessed is really primarily a state of mind that is founded first on being rich toward God. It's founded first on being rich toward God. Ephesians 1 verse 3, Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul felt very blessed. His affection was set on things above. And yet, when you read, you know, some of the lists of Paul's trials, look at the one in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, despite these, Paul considered himself blessed. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? He was speaking a little bit sarcastically about some who were, you know, uh, doubting his true calling by Christ to be a minister of Jesus Christ. He said, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeys often in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches." Despite all of that, we just read in Ephesians that Paul said, my life has been blessed. And he felt greatly blessed in all of those things, despite what he had gone through. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, if you'll turn there to Hebrews chapter 11, in the context of the faith chapter, Paul is describing some others who had been richly blessed, but by what standard? What is the standard here by which you would say these people have been blessed? Ephesians, or Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35. Here is a great blessing. Women receive their dead raised to life again. Tremendous blessing. But then read on. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So here in the context of the faith chapter, Paul's describing some who have been richly blessed, but again, by what standard? Well, what's the standard he's using here? Well, he's using the one that counts the most, of being rich toward God. They had a strong personal relationship with God. They had the promise of eternal life. They had fruits of God's spirit, at least in how they lived their lives. They were richly blessed. 
God was their gold and silver. They were rich toward God. And then if you go back a little bit to verse 13, notice what, Paul, what is written here in Hebrews eleven thirteen about them. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. They had that blessing. We go back to chapter 10 and verse 35 and 36. Therefore, do not, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. They were encouraged to never fail to recognize their greatest blessings because that can erode confidence. And if we get focused on, on things that, focused in a frame of mind of, why isn't God blessing me? Where are my blessings? Well, that can erode our confidence in God and our faith in God, especially with what God is doing now in our lives and what God is going to do in the future. We find that Hebrews tells us to be patient and careful not to let our eyes only get focused on the now and only on the physical. Romans 8, verse 16, 17, and 18. Romans 8. And we find, again, Paul's instructions as they relate to this matter of blessings. Romans 8, verse 16. We're told that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Did you notice that? I mean, we, certainly we focus on being glorified with him. But he goes on, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. One of the dangers of focusing too much on the physical blessings and benefits as a means of measuring our blessing, if we were to do that and not be careful to avoid that, is that we can forget the part that it says in verse 17 that we've also been called to suffer with Christ. There are trials that can go along, that do go along with being a Christian that we never want to forget. We can endure those because we have confidence in God. We can endure those because we have faith in God and in what God promised. We never want to take our eyes off of, of those promises. We are hopeful. We hope for something that is, going to be ha that is going to happen and that is for sure if we're faithful to God. As a minister was talking to a group of men, he took a piece of paper and he made a black dot in the center of it, just like this. Just made a black dot in the center of a piece of paper. And he asked them, he said, what do you see? And they said they see a black dot. And he said, right, uh, but do you see anything other? Anything other than the dot? They all said, no, 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 they don't see anything else. They see the dot. He said, I I'm really surprised. You see, because you've overlooked the most important thing of all, the sheet of paper. Nobody saw the sheet of paper. And then he made the application. He said that in life, we can often easily be distracted by small, dot-like disappointments and painful experiences that can make us prone to forget the innumerable blessings that we do have from the hand of God. And like the sheet of paper, the good things are far more important than some of those adversities, trials, that can monopolize our attention. We fight against that so that we can stay focused on the bountiful blessings from God and maintain being rich toward God. Let's conclude with two scriptures, first in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, and reading here first in verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, this physical flesh and blood, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 
For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And it's the things that are not seen that are eternal that help us to be rich toward God. And then Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13 in verses 5 and 6. We have this reminder. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The most important thing that we can possibly have is that God will never leave us nor forsake us. That helps keep things in perspective, especially when we're going through difficult times. That God will never leave us or forsake us. We can depend on God. We can rely on God. The blessing of the kingdom of God, those blessings, that blessing is going to endure forever. And the blessings of being a part of God's kingdom is beyond what we can imagine as we go through this physical life. And yet God promises that that time is coming. His will is going to be fulfilled. So again, I think as we approach a day in which we set aside to give thanks, to give thanks to God, it is important to realize just how blessed we really are. And to remember that the greatest blessing is being rich toward God. That's what counts the most, to be rich toward God. Let's count our blessings in a way that is pleasing to God.